I've been speaking about minimizing the amount of water added to the concrete and that is absolutely critical to achieving the highest strength result. It's equally critical to contain that water during the curing period. It is essential not to let the concrete dry out prematurely. The ideal condition would be to keep it uh, moist for uh, at least seven days. You can see in the chart on the right there is a huge difference between moist cured concrete and concrete uh, cured in the air. They're referring to compressive strength which is certainly important but it also relates to how much the concrete will shrink, how uh, quickly it will shrink. So there are many reasons to want to keep the concrete moist for as long as possible. Now this seems poorly understood because there are many uh, people in the industry who think just the opposite. In their mind it seems desirable to let the sun get at it and let it all dry out. The very opposite of what you're trying to achieve. The professionals have to make sure that there is always moist curing as part of the process. Here's an illustration of somebody spray curing the concrete. One of the quickest things you can do is spray a membrane over the concrete. You can do that almost immediately after the concrete is placed, which is ideal. And this is very, very commonly used. I'm a bit old fashioned. I still like to see a visible membrane being rolled out over the uh, concrete and I like to see a curing where a water is applied constantly and the concrete is constantly kept damp. So I'm not sure that I'm uh, completely sold on the idea of a spray cure. Perhaps it could be one element of a series of steps that you take to ensure moist curing. Here's a setup that I think is the ideal. This is what you should be moving towards in terms of curing the concrete. This shows a bridge surface. The concrete is very, very freshly placed and it's immediately covered by these curing blankets. They appear to have already been pre-soaked so they are damp as soon as they go on and I suspect that periodically they are wet down during the curing period. Of course a lot of attention has to be placed to these flat surfaces exposed to the sun, exposed to the wind. They are going to dry out very quickly and they need a lot of immediate attention. But even when you're pouring a wall and you reach the top of the wall, you really can't walk away and leave it like that. You're going to get better results if you cover the top of the wall, cover the top of the footing, whatever it is you're constructing should be covered and the goal should be to retain the moisture as long as possible. In many cases, the contractor will be trying to strip the formwork as soon as possible, perhaps even within 24 hours. But that leaves the concrete exposed to rapid drying, which is undesirable. If there is a compelling need to remove the formwork, the concrete should still be covered to create this moist environment and enhance the curing. This is an overhead view. It's the uh, same site in the previous photo. You can see two concrete trucks are in place uh, placing this concrete. Now because of this configuration they are placing a micro silica overlay in other words, the concrete slab is already in place. That's why the trucks can ride on it. And now they're just putting on a thinner overlay. And you can see how this is done. There's a finishing machine that strikes it off. And immediately behind that is a rolling bridge. And there are two people there stretching out this wet, I'm not sure what it is. It 
Sometimes it can be a wet a burlap or some kind of a canvas cover, but it's pre-moistened and I'm sure that it's uh, kept moist during the curing period. Similar practice is used when pouring the bridge deck itself, and I'm sure it was used here. Immediately behind the finishing machine, as soon as the masons have struck off the surface, it should be covered and the covering should be kept moist during the curing period. I want to speak about formwork for routine concrete structures. This is a, uh, a wall, it's an abutment wall for a bridge, but this is typical of activities required to construct a concrete wall. You begin by erecting the back face of the wall and that's already in place in this photo. After that is erected, it's plumbed and braced so that it's uh, in exactly its final location. And then the lathers can begin placing the rebar. On the right hand side, you can see a strip of water stop. Here's another view of the back face and the rebar in this view has been completed. So both faces of the rebar are installed. The white plastic tubing that you see is a sleeve which will contain the tie rods joining the formwork together. Formwork for a wall like this consists of a back form and a front form which are joined together by means of a tie rod. The tie rod is what carries the hydrostatic load of the concrete and these are very very high loads. If you pour the wall uh, reasonably quickly it will exert a full hydrostatic head for the full height of the wall. So we're talking about very high loads here. This is the front face. It's uh, quite typical of the way walls are formed. The formwork is made up of smaller panels which can be manhandled and then the panels are ganged together to form larger panels. This is a very efficient way to work. The panels can be rented as well as purchased. You can get many reuses out of the panels, which makes them very efficient. And even at some point where the face of the panel is badly worn, you can simply reface them and get further use out of the panels. So this is an excellent procedure for forming these kinds of walls. There are two kinds of hardware here. These are uh, some kind of quick coupling device designed specifically for these panels. It joins the panels together into a gang. And these rods are the tie rods that go through and through and carry the hydrostatic head of the concrete. Here's a typical arrangement. On the right hand side you have a completed set of formwork. The tie rods have been protected here with these yellow plastic caps so that you don't have any kind of a sharp object protruding into the workspace. On the left hand side you could uh, just see the beginning of a set of formwork and in the middle there's an open space. So the arrangement here is to pour alternate panels. This is a, a nice way to proceed because it allows the panels to shrink somewhat. When you place concrete there is an initial shrinkage which is really unavoidable and then there is a long-term shrinkage. So by pouring alternate panels that initial shrinkage takes place and when you pour the intermediate panel you're more likely to get a, a tighter 
uh, structure. Now I've explained to you how these uh, precast panels are very popular, very efficient. It's the way the industry works. But this carpenter is actually working with uh, loose uh, sheets of plywood and he's uh, building a form by hand. Now what is that all about? Well the ready-made panels are excellent for the back face and front face but you need to close off the ends of the pores in what we call a bulkhead form. This is a very complicated form which has to be made by hand and the form has to allow all of the rebar to penetrate and pass through the form and then all of that has to be braced by hand it has to be secure it carries the same hydrostatic head as the front face and the rear face after the concrete is placed the uh, form panels are removed but then somebody has to go into this space and remove the bulkhead form which is very hard to remove because a little concrete has seeped through all of the openings for the rebar and that form is pretty much cemented in place and you need uh, wrecking bars you need to really literally tear it out a great deal of time is consumed in constructing the bulkhead forms and then removing the bulkhead forms what we just saw is the typical two-face form but you will run into situations where you use a single face form this is a project where the structural wall was poured up against a slurry wall so there is only access from one side and the form in this case has to be extremely stiff and extremely well braced because there are no tie rods so the hydrostatic head of the wet concrete has to be carried by these inclined braces and each brace has to be anchored to the floor slab and of course you have all of the issues associated with the bulkhead form. There, there is a form in place here and that too is being braced with these uh, incline braces. In addition to forming walls there are forms required for columns, forms required for the beams that span between the columns. So this is an, an arrangement that's uh, fairly typical. You can see there's a concrete column that's already been constructed and now the formwork for a concrete beam is being placed. The formwork here is being supported by pipe shores. The shores uh, can be erected in any height and with a screw adjustment on the top they can be set exactly at the elevation that you need. Now this horizontal form can also be made stiff enough and strong enough so that it can span between two columns without the, the need for the pipe shoring. It's not clear whether the pipe shores here will be carrying the load of the wet concrete or they may be used just temporarily to join together the segments of the formwork which will then be freestanding. Either system is perfectly satisfactory. The formwork for the beam is also attached to the previously poured column and I'd like to focus in on that. You can get a better look at the column itself an attempt has been made here to give the surface of the column some interest so there are horizontal and vertical ribs there are rounded corners and that's a an excellent treatment without really adding significantly to the cost you can get a much more pleasing look and that's what's done here now having said that they have also attached this bracket which will carry the formwork and possibly even carry the weight of the concrete. It's, it's not clear. You can see pretty clearly here a lot of the concrete has been spalled. Now 
I'm sure what was uh, done here is that the anchors attaching the bracket were drilled in later and of course in the course of drilling them in they might hit some rebar or just the action of drilling them in might cause the concrete to spall. Uh, no amount of patching is going to hide that defect. You're going to see that defect for the life of this structure. A better approach would be to cast inserts into the original column and this could easily have been done. In fact, you can see two holes here. I'm not sure what these holes are, but this is a good illustration of how this problem could have been solved. Inserts could have been installed, which were uh, symmetrical with this uh, groove pattern, and they really would have been um, hidden in the finished product. There is no need to do this drilling later on, and you can see there's great risk in, in doing the drilling later. In addition, when you cast the inserts into the concrete, they have much more capacity than a drilled-in insert, so you would probably need far fewer inserts. The point here is that all of this needs to be planned in advance, and that planning makes a world of difference in the finished product. You want that as cast concrete to look as good as you can possibly make it. it requires a lot of attention to all of these details.